All right, we are back for another sweet podcast on the history of beer. I am joined tonight by Malcolm Purington. He is a professor of history, and he specializes in one of my favorite types of history, the history of beer. How are you, Malcolm? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's always nice to have you on the show and uh, geek out on a bunch of stuff. Uh, we'll try and focus, you know, on the one thing, but I know how we are. We'll eventually, oh. you know, branch out and maybe go off a couple of tangents. But I wanted to talk to you about one thing tonight. Uh, one thing that I know is close to, to your heart, close to your home. The history of Pilsner, the most popular type of beer ever, I believe. And uh, I know this is important to you because that was sort of, well, your PhD thesis, right? Yeah, I wrote my entire dissertation on the history of the Pilsner and why it is the most popular beer in the world and mm -hmm. the most popular beer in history. I'm actually uh, yeah, working on the manuscript right now. So look for a publication. We'll be, we'll, we'll be keeping in touch on when that's, when that's going to be happening. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, yeah, Pilsner is very very close to my heart and, and my belly. It is, uh, was my least favorite beer, uh, when I started my, <laughs> oh yeah. What, what was your favorite beer then? And what is your favorite beer now? Was it informed by history or was it just a change of taste because of you meet you? Well, you must have met so many people writing and studying and traveling. Oh yeah. No, I, I even though I was spending my days in archives, uh, and libraries in, Well, <laughs> I was in Belize, I was in South Africa, I was in Germany, I was in Dublin, uh, London. Mm -hmm. And so I'd spend my days inside these libraries and archives in the evenings. I'd meet up with brewers and other beer writers and, and historians too. And uh, yeah, I got to meet a lot of people in all these different countries to learn about what was going on there in terms of, well, mostly about craft beer uh, and how that's kind of changed from like the whatever the dominant brewery or breweries were in those countries, generally Pilsner producing mm -hmm. breweries uh, and how they were kind of changing um, to meet a new idea about what, what beer could be, you know, mostly along ale lines. So uh, before I wrote about the Pilsner, it was, uh, I mean, honestly, it was Belgian IBLs that got me started in the beer, like nice. And I brewed like for years, I only brewed Belgian style beers. So focusing nice. on like yeast, focusing on like adding some Belgian candy sugar, like I mean, give me a Chimay Blue right, or right. Eight. It was just that's that's what got me into beer because it just was a whole another level that I hadn't understood before. Now, ah, now it kind of depends on the time of year. Right now, I'm loving having a a Mad Elf from Trogues Brewing Company, which has honey and cherry. Nice. Uh, give me a double IPA too, and I love all of the you know craft pilsners that are coming out as well it's pretty sweet seeing how things have are coming back around much more rapidly than they did in the 19th century for the pilsner yeah. I, i could see why you would love the craft pilsners because there there are two key things with the pills for a microbrewery first of all it is hard as hell to produce a niche uh, sorry a, well a niche neat flavorful pills that you can actually compare to the original Pilsner Urkel, right? From the big brewery that started it all in Bohemia and Czech Republic. So that's the first thing. And then because of that, the second thing, and you correct me if I'm wrong, the second thing is, well, because it's so damn hard to produce a nice pills, once you got there, you've got your reputation quite established. Definitely. Yeah, it is the simplest and hardest Simplest beer that is the hardest to create well. The naked beer. I believe this is how we st we should start and you know weave our way through its history, because it, it there is a sort of miraculous origin story behind that. You have a um, beer that for the first time seems to be completely devoid of any sort of sediments, bright as a clear sky. Why? What happens? Did people become wizards all of a sudden? It was, well, it was accumulation of a number of wonderful factors uh, tied to British, the British brewing industry and the industrialization of the late 18th century. 
um, along with the development of lagering beer. So lager means to store in German. And mm -hmm. so the lager of beer is to store the beer for you know, a period of time. So you just have lager, we know what we're expecting. Uh, and you start seeing brewers in Munich. So like Gabriel Settlemeyer Sr. at Spaten, um, you know, utilize these, these lagering techniques to create a different type of beer. And beer in continental of Europe up really until around the Pilsner is really inconsistent. Like they're starting to incorporate some of the new technology, um, but it's Gabriel Sedemeyer Jr. and Anton Dreyer. So Gabriel Sedemeyer Jr. from Munich, um, Anton Dreyer from Vienna, um, both going to be inheriting their family's breweries. And part of the apprenticeship of kind of becoming a brewer in continental Europe at this time is to travel visit right. lots of different breweries across all the different nations and learn what's like what other people do, create networks. And they decide uh, in the 1830s to go to England. There's not exactly like, it's not like a bottle sharing situation right now. It's not like they're showing mm -hmm. up and people know who they are or they really know who the people are that they're visiting. Uh, so they're, they're trying to figure out, okay, best place in the world right now for beer in the 1830s quality and quantity you're going to england there's no place else you can go why but, what's there in england what happens there oh man this is like the moment i mean the, you got the porter you got the pale ale you've got like all of these really well well developed technologically mm -hmm. advanced beers so they're producing beers on a scale like with the rise of the porter which we talked about you know at a different podcast about just the economies of scale they're able to use the capital from that to be able to, you know, innovate, utilize new technologies, bring in more of that steam technology through the industrial revolution that's going through the late 18th century, which has slowly, over the course of the early part of the 19th century, spread outwards across the English Channel to the Low Countries, to like the German Confederation lands and so on. Uh, and so now they're starting to try and figure out how they can incorporate that into the brewing in Central Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, what they do, I mean, this is my favorite story, industrial espionage, like the British brewers. Oh, are, we love that. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> such a great story, honestly, because they're they're just trying to learn, like, all right, how do you do this? What's your, like, ratio of malt hops? Like, how are you doing this? And so this is when they're first introduced to thermometers and sacrometers, sacrometers right. measuring, like, the amount of sugar content. Of the malt and they basically took this like metal pipe painted it brown had a valve on the bottom and they would dip this into like the brewing like the vats and try and take that back and then, like try and test it and figure out like okay what's going on how are they doing this because the british brewers were very closed-mouthed about how they were doing it. they did not want to share any secrets with anybody because they were in such close competition with their british their other like english rivals they were so, quite paranoid weren't they oh, because they, they 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 there was a, a very fierce competition and they were essentially family businesses and um they wrote in codes i believe as uh many other brewers at the time or at least up until that time were doing and uh what you're saying proves that they were right <laughs> yep <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like they, Anton Dreyer and, and Gabriel Sittelmeyer Jr. had, but he's like the, I think perhaps the only sacrometer in Europe, like continental Europe, when they returned in, hmm. uh, after their, their journeys. And at first they actually kind of kept it like close to the chest. They, at first they did not share this knowledge, but they quickly decided like, you know what, this is going to be better for everybody if we all start using this technology. And just huh. as they were doing as, as apprentices, learning from all these other brewers, uh, across continental Europe, like, you know what? People need to learn from us as well. Like Anton Dreyer, you know, they also learned more about different aspects of malting, how to make paler malts. So Anton Dreyer does that and he comes up with the Viennese lager. So a nice reddish style, utilizing some of that new malting techniques that they had been exposed to in England. And Gabriel Sotomayor Jr. goes back to Munich and he starts incorporating all of that too into the Spaten Brewing Company. So the Pilsner, you know, not too far away, you know, over in Bohemia at that point, 
part of the Austrian Empire. Uh, they're in, Bo in Bavaria and Bohemia, they're really like learning from each other too. Like in Pilsen, they unfortunately had really terrible brewers and really had no idea what they were doing in 1836 when they had a beer tester come up from Vienna who said, you got to pour out all your beer because it's not safe. <laughs> And they they did that right they they yeah. uh, they what they they blew open the casks uh, a couple of them maybe forty and they just <laughs> poured that onto the street. There yeah. you go. We will free the town of this evil stale beer. Was it was it stale or was it contaminated or just was it just flat out terrible? You know the specifics on that. I'm not. I think it was more contamination. Um, stale very different from like what we think about it's not like aged or anything like that like they were okay. they were like we're in a moment of transition to even starting to know like how lagering is like spreading across like central right, Europe. right right so i mean like what happens is that the heads of the town like the town businessmen the burgers they hire this architect to go travel around europe just as the other guys were doing to try and figure out what is the most modern way to produce beer how mm -hmm. can we like we can't not have beer we can't have good beer we have, must have really good beer to keep the other industries of pilsen going forward no one's going to want to move here if the beer's getting poured down the drain right because yeah. beer is such a staple in in everyday life beer is considered as an ingredient as a meal as a sustenance it's also a way to prove your manly worth i will put that in quotes because obviously that's a perception um But also, it seems that the other thing that is happening, and you correct me if I'm wrong, because I might be blowing this out of proportion, but Pilsner hiring this architect who's like, what, 24 years old? Like, he's super young and he's never done a brewery, but, you know, they trust him, which is fine. And uh, they send him up and they send him, they send him off. And uh, it seems that what they're after is a sort of... a uh, make bohemia great again right because bohemia used to be a huge center of brewing i mean one of the very very first far from being the only one but it, this is a city in bohemia that prides itself in good superior beer there used to be a time where they exported that thing and they received compliments but over the years over the centuries that kind of fades away for a couple of reasons and this is what i wanted to tell you earlier it seems Um, at least it's one of the theories that I've read, uh, that the problem is Bavaria and how advanced Bavaria has become because they're neighboring states or provinces or regions and the beer from Bavaria is coming at their door and it's being sold now in Pilsen and the bars in Pilsen have their cask open but not enough people drink them. So, well, oxygen gets inside the, the barrels and then, well, it doesn't really taste as good because it takes a long time for the barrel to empty because there are less people who drink it. It's it's interesting. So many factors in there, right? You yes. have the opportunity given by Bavaria to embrace technology stolen to the Brits or I guess to the to, to the London brewers. Like, I guess that would be more precise. And uh, then you have... Well, this young architect uh, who's touring, what, Bavaria? And he's there to um, help find not necessarily a recipe, but a new type of beer manufacturing. How successful is he exactly at doing that? Very. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, he comes back with you know, learning these new ways of, of building a brewery. So mm -hmm. as, along with a brewer who's well-established um, to come and start like brewing good beer. It doesn't even have to be great beer, but just some good beer that's not going to get poured down the drain in mm -hmm. Pilsen. So he brings Joseph Grohl back, who's from Bavaria. Like his father owns a brewery. He grew up brewing, known to be a very good brewer, also known to be a total jerk. Uh, <laughs> okay. But, uh, Oh, he's, yeah. How, how bad is it? <laughs> well, he, he gets a one-year contract uh, at at like the Citizens Brewery in Pilsen that's not renewed, even though he's the first one to brew a Pilsner. That has got to say a lot about the guy. 
<laughs> doesn't, it doesn't it? So he's utilizing, you know, the new, newish, you know, the technologies that had come over from England. And he's also utilizing like the local types of grains, the light malting techniques um, and lager. So lagering, which is now like become, you know, more of an accepted central European way to brew beer. So utilizing ice caves and things like that, to like age it over long periods of time so that, you know, while it's fermenting, you know, bottom fermentation and then age for a long time, you're going to have that clarity coming to this beer, um, which, you know, once you start coming, Pilsner goes head to head with like the British brewer, like beers, it's completely, you know, you don't have a real competition when it comes to clarity of a beer. Mm -hmm. So Grohl's usually utilizing all of these newest, like the latest technologies, like the architect has come in with like the design for the brewer, like the actual brewery that comes together with the right amount of hops and everything. And suddenly we have a Pilsner in November of 1842, which I mean, the ER, so Pilsner, the ER on the end means from Pilsen in German. And why within two, I think it's like by 1844, you have a brewery producing Pilsner in Prague. By 1848, you have, you have cities all over the place producing Pilsners. Mm -hmm. Already like within the first few years becoming a name that doesn't make any sense in the language that is spoken. It's completely wild. I guess it's as if I somehow <laughs> became a successful brewer and uh, I live in Gatineau, right? This is where we're doing the podcast. This is uh, right at the frontier between the province of Quebec and Ontario and Canada. And uh, I call it the Gatineau, right? Because somehow I, I don't know, I turned out to be a genius and I found a new way to be, to, 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 to brew beer. And I said, well, this is going to be a Gatno. And then you had someone in New York trying to do a beer, uh, just like I do it. And they would call it the Gatno, right? But I would sue that person. I believe this is my beer. I created it. Don't, uh, <laughs> but seriously, no, don't the folks in, in, in Pelson start suing people saying, yeah, well, this is, this is my beer. I, I did it. Me. They try. They really try. I'm like, they it took too long though. They took too long because I mean, like you have to look at the spread of trademark and copyright, which mm -hmm. is a slow spread of its own going through. Like when you have, you have, you know, all these businessmen from pills and put forth a case in England to copyright the name Pilsner. And this is about 1890. Uh, and the judge rules against them because he says, you know, uh, I can see where you're coming from because people are just like putting Pilsner on like anything really. Right. Like, oh, no, but like it's from Pilsen. It has to be like, so we should have the copyright in this country and you have to work through each country individually. And the judge says, no, this is like completely divorced of its geographic origin. You cannot copyright the term Pilsner because it's just, it's a style now. It's basically, it's outside of that domain. This is so unreal. Where is that court again? London. Okay. So you have a court in London that says, look, um, your beer is so popular that you can't claim it. Yeah. In a way. <laughs> I mean, that seems to speak of how unique the Pils or the Pilsner or the Pilsen has uh, been and still is in history. Um, there's nothing quite like it, is there? No, no, there's, there's nothing. I mean, with Porter being the first industrial beer mm -hmm. style and, the, and honestly, one of the first, like, I'd say like recognizable styles of beer. I mean, you mm -hmm. had brown ales, you had, um, <laughs> you had Gruitz, but that was more in terms of like the Gruitz tract, which was like the actual like law that went through. It wasn't mm -hmm. a defined style. Um, like Porter is really the first kind of identifiable global style of beer. Mm -hmm. The Pilsner is, I mean, you have the India pale ale, but that's, that term is only really coming about in the, 19, in the 1830s at the same time as the first Pilsner is about to come on the scene. Mm -hmm. So the Pilsner is, it becomes known over the next, over the rest of the century for a number of different specific attributes, including like, I mean, people know if you're looking at say newspapers in, you know, colonies, you know, European colonies across the globe, 
they would be advertising, you know, everything that's, everything that's coming in on the current ship in the harbor. So the ship is there with the goods from the metropoles, like from, you know, England, France, Germany, so on. And they're going to advertise what they have. They would be advertising, if it's a British ship, they'd be advertising bass, ale, bass IPA, bass port, or also, mm -hmm. or salt, uh, or, you know, these, they were going to advertise for a brand, right, mm -hmm. for a brewery. But then you'd also see references to, we have bottom fermented beer. We have mm -hmm. a lager. We have lagered beer. We have this stuff. Everybody knows that it's not like they're going to have a Viennese lager. They're not going to have a Doppelbach. They're not going to have any of these other types of lagers. They know by the 1890s across the globe that it's going to be a Pilsner, mm -hmm. which there's no comparison to really make. There's just nothing else that's on that level uh, of, ex of acceptance and knowledge um, for the consumers uh, in different parts of the world. This is, you know, prior to radio, prior to any type of like technology of like communication aside from, well, the telegraph, I guess. So the knowledge of the consumers of that is enough for these different colonial newspapers to announce it. There's so many things in there that I find unique and somehow so specific to the story of pills. Well, first of all, you know, you were starting your comparison. I was thinking, so when you have um, the Porter or the IPA, those that are advertising it, when, when they advertise that in the newspapers, when the beer arrives at the port is, well, the name of the manufacturer, the name of the brewer. And then you don't need that with the pills. Because yeah. y'all already know it's going to be good. Yeah. And I wonder, well, what really explains that? I know that it's because it's light and light is considered good. But I'm thinking, is it also the climate? Because that seems to be exported in mostly British colonies um, where people can afford the drink. But you correct me if I'm wrong, because it might be exported to many other places that I'm less aware of. And then I wonder, is it not also about the taste? Because I could see how people that are not used to drinking beer would take to a pills. It's um, sort of the best of both worlds, right? You have the least amount of inconvenience that you would get from a more hoppy or more sedimented beer. And I believe that that becomes part of the publicity, right? At last, you have a beer that does not have sediments in it. A clear, sparkling beer. So what, what really, really is it? Is it the economies of scale? Is it because it has less alcohol? Is it because of, a, of its uh, noble hop, the, the Saz hop? Or is it really because the, 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 the people who do the beer are really good at publicity? Ha, they're terrible at publicity. <laughs> okay, so we can rule that out. <laughs> yeah, because they already know that they don't need it. So then there are all the other factors before. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Um, yeah. So as I argue uh, like in, in my manuscript, is that it's, it's tied to a number of factors of the mid to late 19th century. So... Mm -hmm. You have the, so England first to industrialize, right? But then we have, you know, we're seeing by, you know, after 1871, where we have like Germany and Italy, we're seeing like new nations, we're seeing um, nationalism like spreading across Europe as well. We're seeing the end of like the ancien regimes and so forth. We're seeing new technologies and the acceptance of that through the industrialization of all of these different areas. So, the news, like how does this spread? It's not like they're, you know, putting forth advertising campaigns in a magazine or, you know, on a TV or anything like that. What you do have to spread the news is the spread of trains. Like through the mid, early to mid 19th century, we're seeing trains now kind of kind of like crossing all of like honeycombing uh, Europe. It's continental Europe. So you have travelers that are able to travel. You also have the development of steam engines that, you know, steam ships now that can travel around the globe much, much faster. So it's not just something that's related to 
you know, the super rich or just armies, <laughs> uh, colonizers, like going, you know, to India, across the coast of Africa and so forth. And you're bringing all of the different ideas, the different cultural understandings, the different flavors, like the tastes of these different nations going across the globe. So one thing that Germany is doing, one, it's industrializing and it's doing that very quickly and very well. Um, it's not just the Pilsner, like and it's, Pilsner becomes associated with Germany much more so than Bohemia uh, by the later 19th century because they are producing it, well, on economies of scale and producing it for export because the popularity of Pilsner is so big mm -hmm. already by like the 1870s, 1880s and so on. And so they are like the, they have in Germany, a kind of a shared, like people talk about kind of like the military industrial complex, like that shared knowledge base of like universities and mm -hmm. the government and private industry. In Germany, that type of industrial complex is already growing and then becoming solidified in the latter half of the 19th century, including with beer. So you can look at the dye industry. Um, there are a number of great books looking at this kind of comparison of like what the British are doing versus continental, like especially German industries are doing. So you have this industrial complex of the university systems, of private companies and the German government all supporting innovation and trade and export. So they are known by the later half of the 19th century for producing some of the best consumer goods, as well as like becoming a you know, global player like mm -hmm. on a scene, you know, they're kind of sort of late to the era of empire because they're also sort of late to the consolidation of mm -hmm. Germany as a nation. Uh, but the government is supporting the brewing industries just as it's doing with chemistry, like it, for dyes, perfumes, like, I mean, all of these types of industries. And so you, they actually subsidize the shipping of German private companies' ships to areas around Africa and so forth, which, you know, you're gonna bring stuff down there. You want to bring back raw materials, but one of the things that they would be sure to fill those holds with was with beer, was with beer. Right. And so they knew that they could sell that. And so that beer is gonna make its way through these imperial trade networks, which I argue, I argue is, you know, in my, in my writing, that that was an essential piece to the spread of a global style of beer. The porter didn't really have that global reach hmm. in the early, like when the British, even as the first industrial nation, as the, like the first, like in Britain and France, like, you know, among the very, you know, of industrial imperial powers, as this opens up to Africa, to uh, Southeast Asia, like the, you know, all of these different regions tied to the industrial revolution, tied to technology, what are they going to ship? What are the brewers focusing on? The brewers, even in smaller, smaller towns of Germany, they're producing a Pilsner style for export, not mm -hmm. just for local consumption, because they've got train lines. They're going to Bromberg, going to Hamburg, uh, Bremen and Hamburg to send that beer someplace else. That is so different when you look at what the London brewers or the uh, Burden and Trent brewers are doing versus what the German brewers are doing. What I'm getting from this is it's exactly the opposite, however scale you choose to look at this, because the London brewers at the very least are competing among each other's for the same market, essentially in the UK and mostly in London. And the German brewers, they're collaborating, which is also a dangerous activity, you know, because, you know, the other brewer might learn something from you that might be, you know, not to your benefit. But at the same time, they're collaborating for export markets. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be more different. Oh, exactly. No, that's, that's what I'm arguing in one of my chapters. That's one of the big pieces of the difference of strategy, business strategy. Uh, that is going between the continental brewers versus specifically the English brewers. The Scottish brewers are generally going for export. I mean, out of Dublin, Guinness is exporting, you know, not mm -hmm. only of course, but, you know, under all their bottlers' names. And 
I mean, one of the funny things, so uh, the first yeast when Carlsberg is founded, right, by Jacobsen in Denmark, right, Copenhagen, uh, right. he gets his first lager yeast from Spaten in Munich. And guess what? Guess where Heineken gets its first yeast to start brewing its beer in the Netherlands from Carlsberg. I was going to suggest betrayal. <laughs> Open sharing. Like Carlsberg, like they decide to build like a laboratory um, at the brewery wow. that's open for training professional brewers, almost exclusively for lager Pilsner production. Right. And out of that comes a lot of the professionalization and brewing lager type beers. And I know this is extremely significant because throughout the Middle Ages, the people that are generally good at making beer, they encrypt their notes. They write in such a manner that, well, you have to know the guy to know what he means when he says, employ this method using three symbols of fertility in order to have a beer that will look like a moonscape. I know I'm saying random things, but you understand that yeah. I know that the messages, the codes, the recipes are encrypted so that no one can know. So the Carlsberg experiment really seems to sit in its entirely different universe. It seems to be kind of uh, a novelty for brewing, really. Okay, no, no, I, I, I may not know you, but I don't think you're going to steal all my secrets. In fact, I would like to share some with you so that together we can essentially export more beer everywhere in the world. Yeah, I mean, the, if you look at like who was attending the classes at Carlsberg Laboratory, uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't it wasn't just Danish. It was not just German, uh, you know, or Czech or Austrian or French. It was Brazilian. It was like people were coming from all over the world in the later half of the 19th century. Um, I mean, people from Japan uh, coming by the 1890s. Like you are seeing people from across the globe coming there to all learn the same ways of making beer, going back to their respective locations and to produce it. Very, very different from what, uh, well, what the goals were too for the British brewers um, or the American brewers, honestly. So like, it's a very different, very different story. I mean, the fact that, <laughs> that so many brewers felt that they needed to like in you know the middle ages and like early modern era that they had to you know use secret you know language when the number of people who could actually read was so small also doesn't quite yeah odd uh, so yeah the pilsner has it's really it's such a such a amazing story. <laughs> like, it's it, one and of it, it, it to do when I started my PhD. It, what? Sorry, can you repeat that? I was not expecting to focus on when I started my PhD, like looking at the history of beer. Yeah, Pilsner was not not what I was expecting. I would think that has to do with the fact that you don't have the instinct to look at the most obvious thing, the thing that is most visible, that is most present, tend to be the thing that you get more used to, so you look away from it. But then again, it's funny because in French, I did a series of podcasts on uh, on laggers, not as extensive in details as this podcast that we have right now, but uh, that we're recording right now. But uh, I, I did learn a few things. And in my research, I tried Pilsner Urkel. And it was, the beer was so good. And also so different from the kind of beers that I'm used to drink, which is, um, as someone who lives in North America, almost necessarily, almost unavoidably, an IPA. I brew IPAs, I drink IPAs. When I go to a new bar, I ask uh, whoever is there at the table, what is their best IPAs, right? Mm -hmm. And um, getting more interested about the history of brewing, particularly about the 19th century, because there's so much stuff that is happening in the 19th century. Just think about the commune in 1871 in Paris that is essentially a test bed for all the horrors of the 20th century. But on, on the more happy note, on the more happy note, you get the pills. You get this 
friendly, tasty, um, really, really bright golden beer that uh, you don't drink. You take a bite off. That's what they say at the, the brewery that said the whole thing. And uh, it really made me reconnect with the type of beer that I had, I think, uh, neglected. And only because it was so predominant, only because it was the beer everybody was drinking. And now I realize there's a richness to the history of uh, lager, to the history of pills. There are some really, really good pills out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, even I mean, Pilsner Alcohol, that they changed their recipe a while ago uh, to go to go off of what the original like production mm -hmm. was. So like Star Perlman um, in Czech Republic is they still do a decoction process, mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that you see with more um, craft craft brewers who are trying who are producing uh, Pilsners. They will go back to the decoction process instead of like having a straight heat um, rise to a boil. Um, I, wait a second. I feel like we should explain that to our, our listeners or viewers. Decoction, is it the process where you take part of the mash, you boil it, bring it back to the mash? Yes. Why Why do you do that? Uh, there's a number of theories. Like part is... Um, I mean, before you had like real control of temperature, it was, it was a better way to control the temperature. So oh. if it was getting too hot, you could cool it off and vice versa. But there's also like um, the idea that it also extracts more of the fermentable uh, material from uh. you know, more of the maltose uh, from the grains. So you're basically kind of mashing and remashing over mm. and over. I mean, if we think about like, you know, what was going on prior to efficient mashing when they would have you know, several runs of the mash. They'd mash, mm -hmm. mash the grain once, get as much sugar off of it as possible. That'd be like your high, high octane beer. Do it again. You'd have something like middling. Then you'd have like your small beer, your table beer that you would, you know, have for breakfast and for the kids, that type of thing. So using this decoction process, you don't have to do these different runs. You're able to kind of like put it back in while right. your change. Yes, yes. And for our viewers and listeners, uh, we're talking at a time where, yes, beer was something that you gave to your kids for breakfast. <laughs> and uh, essentially, that process consists of um, pouring water through your mash, which is a mix of water and then cereals, mm -hmm. over and over again to obtain different, let's, let's say, mashes with at the end, a different alcohol content. Am I right? Is this a proper way of explaining that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each mash would have, like the first yeah. one would have more sugar coming from those cereals. Second would have a little bit less and so on. And these small beers, like these small, or table beers, mm -hmm. uh, for kids, like they were safer than the water, but they were right. also, the amount of alcohol was negligible. Like there was almost mm -hmm. no alcohol whatsoever. It, like what made this stuff safe was because the sugar water was then boiled. Yeah. So I mean, when when tea comes through in the in Great Britain in like you know the 18th century, the brewers took a hit <laughs> because <laughs> really. Oh wait, boiling. This is like so much. This is this is better. This is a lot easier. Um, so like yeah, different moments like hits hits for the brewers. Um, but yeah. So yeah. So like the decoction process was. Uh, what they were originally doing to produce like the first Pilsners. Um, so for Pilsner at Bell and Pilsner at Bell only changed their name from Citizens Brewery in the 1890s when they wanted to, when they learned that they could not copyright the name Pilsner, we're going to have Pilsner at Bell, Pilsner from the source. So the original. I Pilsner. see. They can't yet exactly win in court, but they still want to prove their point, which is, hey, you want the real stuff? come to our door because yes we're still brewing yes we're still in business they're uh, they're still active by the way if you want to go to czech republic i think that awesome. they're they, they've won a couple of uh, uh you know historical awards as uh first brewery to have their own train shipping their own beer to other places and all sorts of interesting things like that but the real question here malcolm is it's a one hundred thousand dollars 
dollars question. What is your favorite pills? Oof. Wow. Be careful about what you're going to say next. History will judge you on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, there, there, there's a lot of very, very good pills out there. Yeah, I mean, I, have, I mean, the impossible question. One, one of my most local ones, uh, the story that I also I really appreciate. So it was actually um, Zero Gravity's Vermont Lager. All right. Because uh, when I was actually writing my dissertation, I was up in Vermont. So I'm originally from Vermont, currently in Boston. Um, and I was, it was winter time in Vermont and it was very dark and I was alone. And, you know, I just needed a break from my blue screen of my computer. And so I went right. to Zero Gravity, met up with the brewer and um, talked to him about the Vermont lager. So I was just like, all right, can you tell me why are you making this beer? Like your mm -hmm. IPAs are great, your sours, your gruits are great. I mean, all these other styles you're doing why are you making this one? Is it just for a specific demographic of people who want light lagers? Uh, and he's like, oh no, this is, my, this is my dream. This is like the beer I've been trying to make since I first visited Czechoslovakia in the 1980s. I was like, you're kidding me. He's like, no, 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 this is exactly, this is why I'm making this beer. This is like my, this is the dream that I've been trying to have for the past couple of decades to be able to make a good lager, a good Pilsner. I'm like, wow. So the beer itself is excellent. It is like, yeah. it's very easy to mess up a Pilsner. And that one is very good, but I love also the narrative behind it. I love the, the authentic desire to like, after years of being a brewer, decades, honestly, before he produced it, um, where he found that like that, that's part of the beer being good for me. It's it's so interesting. It's as if this was a really personal, deeply emotional, semi-religious experience in the sense that he found his truth, you know? Mm -hmm. he, but the, the, the amazing part of the story is that his truth was in the Czech Republic. And um, it seems okay, to me like... He, back then. <laughs> Czechos yes, Czechoslovakia. I, I, okay, this has nothing to do with beers. I was in Cuba once and I had their, I play harmonica. So I was, uh, I was playing harmonica and uh, there was this guy who had a guitar who just starts jamming with me. So we jam and then people make it a karaoke. People sta start improvising a, a song out of it. And we start chatting in Spanish and he tells me, wait here, do not move. I'll be back. I wait, comes back. This huge harmonica with i think 80 notes and it said made in czechoslovakia <laughs> which is a country that does not exist anymore and yep. then we have the date 1973 oh, and wow. here i am at home now looking at my past with misplaced nostalgia thinking this is a historical relic. I must only touch it with the best of intentions. <laughs> but you know, this is this is the kind of things that you know, like the the greatest conversations. Because this, we had a sacred moment. We jammed together. We made music together. We had a very very good chat about life and death. And he gives me this harmonica at the end and. I'm getting emotional here, but that reminds me with the beer that you like, with people that you 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 get along with, you have a sacred moment and you want to share that. And I can understand that you would be meeting with your brewer who's trying to replicate that experience with a good beer that he had in a unique moment at a unique place in history. These are the good times, man. Oh, I mean, why why else do they think they had Bacchus and Dionysus? <laughs> oh God, don't get me started on Dionysus <laughs> because I this will not end. <laughs> yeah, we want to back to ancient history with all of all of the gods goddesses for the most part and gods mm -hmm. like, going through devoted to that level of experience. Legit religious experience and also the connections that humans can make through the social lubricant of 
alcohol. I'm sorry, but I I have to reply to this. So very recently, <laughs> very recently, um, uh, I believe Brian Murarescu wrote this book and published it and uh, became a sort of a podcast celebrity talking about the uh, immortality key, right? Uh, this um, sacred ingredient that might have been uh, spiked in different wines to reach a sort of uh, communication level with the gods, right? I believe you you probably heard of that. Anyway, is it like Ergot or like... Ergot, most likely. There are yeah. two, let's say, pretty compelling archaeological evidences in two different sites, one in, that, one in Spain, one in, I believe in Crete, but I'm not sure on that. Don't quote me on that. That um, Ergot, which in the 1970s, essentially gave us LSD might have been part in the fifties. Yeah. It, it might have had a part to play in the, uh, Eleusis mysteries, Eleusian mysteries. Forgive ah. my, 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 my French. I, I'm more familiar with the, the French terms, yeah. but essentially, yes. Um, beer and wine in very ancient times and different rituals were considered pretty much a highway to heaven in the sense that intoxication whether through drugs or alcohol might make a god out of yourself for a very temporary moment and i find that there is a continuity to that although in a much more secular way in the sense that um being slightly drunk seems to put you in a very, very different mood with yourself, with how you view yourself, with how you view others. That uh, the frat, the fraternities, um, for instance, or the uh, teenage parties try and get a sense of community out of drunkenness. This is a huge tangent. So I'm going to step in there for a little bit because also... Please do. Are- Please those, do. Those, those ages, age levels too, is, uh, it's also part of a rebellion. So it's an mm-hmm. area, it's a time period of identity development. And so trying to understand your relationship to yourself as well as to other people that are your, your, your social circle, your, your people, you know, whether it's, you know, through the high school parties, the, um, through the you know, fraternity, sorority, you know, all these, these different aspects. But I do want to jump back because a little bit, one of the funny things about the Pilsner is that it is a lower alcohol beer. And one of the That's things right. that really helped it uh, help its ascension was the fact that it was a low alcohol beer. Uh, we would call it a session today, right? Um, a beer that could be, you could have many and still be fully lucid, perhaps slightly buzzed, but mm-hmm. so you can open up those pathways of communication without going into a brownout or a blackout. Right. And that was one of the things that helped and it was very, really helped it go through because temperance organizations were even advocating for people to drink specifically Pilsners, whether you are in the United States or if you are in Netherlands or in England, like other places, because England had the higher oct- octane, higher oct- alcohol beers. So one of the ways that the Pilsner was able to spread also was through the fact that it was a beer that could be drank all day without leading to over intoxication in comparison to whiskey, rum, gin. Think about the gin right. craze in London in the early early part of the 18th century. I mean, it's not going to be something that you are shooting. It's something that you are be enjoying over a longer period of time with people that you want to have conversations with. Mm-hmm. Yep, that sustains the lifestyle. It sustains the conversation. You 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 are still able to focus to, you know such a level that a regular normal conversation uh, requires and um, this is an american phenomenon isn't it in the sense that the pilsner starts losing a few degrees of alcohol as it hits the american market and becomes a big thing there because the, the pills in the u.s seems to be somewhat less um, or so, so seem, they, they seem to have 
less alcohol than their German counterparts. If we look at when the Pilsner is spreading, mm -hmm. it is a lower alcohol beer, generally under 5%. Okay. So across the board, across the board, it's a lower alcohol beer. And that's one of the, that's one of the things that like all of the newspapers and journals and uh, government, you know, bureaucrats are talking about when they're talking about British beers versus the Pilsner versus lagers, you know, which just become to mean the Pilsner uh, if you speak of speak about it any place outside of Central Europe. So it's a clear distinction between other any other style of beer is that lower alcohol content. That's right. So much to drink about. Oh, sorry. So much to think about. So much history in there. <laughs> Malcolm, thanks very much for uh, having been with us during this podcast. Thanks for your time. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much for having me. This has been a blast. All right. We'll have more of these, I bet. Don't hesitate to subscribe. There'll be much more of these coming soon. Have a good time. Cheers.